Hello, today we are going to be talking about early art and architecture in Indian history. The important features of Indian art in the early period are going to be related towards religion. So we're going to first discuss Hindu gods and the role they play in Indian art. And then we're going to look at early examples of temples that were carved directly out of stone in caves. And then we're going to look at the more common form of temples, which are the brick and mortar um, stone temples um, that are built above ground. So there are different stages of art and architecture in Indian history. The oldest is ancient. Um, that goes back to the Indus River Valley civilization. And then we're going to look in the last um, 2,000 years. We have some great examples of cave and stone carvings. Um, and then starting in the early medieval period and in the medieval period um, more um, thoroughly, I guess, you have the beginning of standalone temples that are in existence. And then with the uh, influence of Islamic civilization in India, you're going to see the rise of Islamic art and architecture. Uh, with a high point during the Mughal dynasty. So we're going to see Islamic palaces and um, tombs. And then with the rise of the British Empire, you're going to see colonial architecture, and then finally uh, modern. In the, um, this lecture, we're going to look at the first three of these six um, periods. So early art is going to be heavily influenced by religion. And I would say even to the present day in India, because it is a very religious country and Hinduism plays a big role, um, religion is, is very foundational to art and architecture. And one of the reasons why is that there's so many images of gods and these, these idols of gods are considered gods in themselves and the, the place that you worship them and where their presence is. So one of the acts of worship, how do you, you know, go and venerate that statue is just to see the the idol. So darshan is a word that means sight, but it's an act of worship. So just catching a glimpse of one of these statues of gods is in fact worship. So where do these gods and these, um, you know, the styles come from? Well, you know, it's a history class, so everything's going to go back to the history of India. And we're going to start with Indus River Civilization. Um, they're very talented artists. Remember seeing the dancing girl, for example, but they had a lot of different sculpture that influenced future Indian um, iterations of how they, you know, imagine their gods. The Aryans come in, they bring the Indo-European culture, um, they develop a lot of the concepts of gods that they have in Hinduism, so they're going to be responsible for influencing it as well. The Greeks make their way, and if you know anything about ancient history, the Greeks were outstanding at sculpture and art. And so they're going to influence particularly the Northwest. So um, the way that Buddha, for example, is depicted in that region is a very Greek style to it. And so there's going to be a regional variety depending on the history of the area. So anything in the Northwest might have a little bit more Greek than later Persian influences. In the South, there's going to be a, a unique Dravidian um, style of art and architecture. So there is variety across India. One of the early examples of a religious statue um, are the numerous examples of mother goddesses that are found across India. And this is a type of image that is almost universal to all early civilizations, whether they're Roman or Greek, African or American or other places in Asia. You're going to see a female figure that has very pronounced sexual features. It's very large breasts, for example. And they're going to be connected to your fertility in life. When you think about women giving birth, bringing life into the world, also the earth, um, you know, provides life um, and is often seen as a feminine form. So these statues are going to be venerated in, or in, in order to bring about fertility, life, and food. And this connection between sexuality um, and religion and images is very pronounced in India. So other civilizations kind of... Um, there was a rupture, but in India is still connected. And you can see this most pronounced and most famously in a traditional stone temple in Kojuraho. 
And if you look at the different images very closely, you find a lot of figures that are um, in the middle of a sexual act. And it's kind of interesting, particularly for Westerners or maybe even the Islamic um, invaders coming into India. And they look at this temple and they see a religious site and it just has a proliferation of sexual images on the side. So it's a very interesting temple structure. Um, and it shows that connection between sexuality, religion, and art. And it's still very strong and pronounced in Indian civilization. One of the things that's really fascinating is, is you see all these images of gods. And I think India has produced more images of gods than any other civilization, any other polytheistic civilization. And they have so many gods and such rich symbolism. So when you look at um, these images of gods, one thing you'll be drawn to are the different objects. And you can identify which god it is by the objects, and each object has particular meaning. So one thing that I find interesting, and this is kind of important, um, is Krishna will always have a flute, okay? Or not always, but it was often depicted with a flute. Shiva often has a crescent moon. Uh, Rama has a, a bow from um, his story, Ramayana. And so he's pictured with a, uh, you know, this bow. So that's one thing that you notice. Another thing is that you always notice that they have multiple heads or arms. These have so many tasks to do. So to think of God that can do everything with just two two arms and one head is kind of seen as foolish. So we see Brahma, so he's going to have four heads. Um, Shiva will have three heads sometimes. And so you'll be able to identify the deity based on how many heads or how many arms they have. And then another example is um, Buddha. So Buddha has rich symbolism associated with his um, um and images. One example is sometimes you'll see a small amount of hair on top of his head, which um, is supposed to depict his soul coming out of his, his body. He'll have maybe a dot between his eyes, which is a, a dot of wisdom. Sometimes you'll look at his ears and they'll be very long. These elongated ears will show that he has heightened perception. Um, his hands are often in symbolic gestures, um, making a, a particular symbol. Um, so each of these statues, when you look at them, they're very rich in detail in terms of the symbolism and the objects that they have. One of the most famous images in all of India are the dancing Shiva statues. Um, these are um, come from particularly the most famous versions from the Chola dynasty. And so um, the statue is called Dancing Lord. And if you look at the bottom, there's a little demon that is being crushed by Shiva. And around him, you'll see the circle, which is actually little flames of fire. And he also has fire in his hand to destroy. And then he also has a drum in his other hand to create. And this, though Shiva is a god of destruction, so it's actually that it's destruction, then creation. And there's this constant circle of life. So now that we've covered a, a little bit about Hindu gods and how they're represented, let's look at how they are um, first represented in a structure, in a, in, a, in a temple. So the oldest are actually cave or stone carvings. So these religious spaces are actually, um, you know, carved right into the stone. This starts a lot with the Buddhist and Jain monks, but later is adapted by Hindus. And you think about these Buddhist and Jain monks, they want to escape the world, right? And so they're going to go to very isolated spots. They're going to go onto, um, you know, mountain ranges, um, cliffs. They're going to carve out a room for prayer and meditation. Now, the most famous are Ajanta, Alora, and Elephanta caves. And most of these are in eastern and central India. There's also in the south, there's um, Mahabalipuram, which is just Hindu, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So these are the oldest um, religious spaces, and then we're going to talk a little bit after all of these about some temples and the transition to the stone um, temples. The first ones we're going to talk about is the Ajanta Caves. They're a collection of 20 cave temples that are built around the 5th century. So these are extremely old. And you can see from the picture on the bottom right there that they're really into the um, cliff 
of the uh, this this mountainside. And over time, they were actually lost and kind of damaged and forgotten about. The locals knew about it, but the wider world didn't know about it. And they were only rediscovered in the beginning of the 19th century. And what you see in these caves are a lot of Buddhist art, which talk about um, Buddha and his different past reincarnations. And what's particularly interesting, you'll see some um, stone carvings up there um, on, the, on the right side, top right. But is, what's particularly interesting is the um, painting there on the left. It's absolutely stunning. I don't know if you've ever studied art history, but um, if you've seen, you know, medieval art, it's pretty, pretty poor in, in quality. And then in, in the Renaissance, you get this kind of more lifelike representation. But look at the expression and look at the features of this painting that is, uh, you know, a thousand five hundred years old um, of Buddha. And it's absolutely uh, outstanding. Um, so it's a very high quality um, ancient painting that is truly impressive. The next cave we're going to talk about is the Laura Cave. This is truly um, an astonishing complex of caves. There's 34 caves. Um, there are Buddhist, Jain, and Hindu caves all next to each other. And it took about five centuries to construct, so it evolved over time, starting in the 5th and then going all the way to the 10th century, and it's carved, again, from solid stone. Um, if you look at that, that um, image on the bottom right, you can see the ground level, right? And then you can see how this uh, the workers kind of carved almost probably straight down to form um, these temples. And then if you look above um, that image on the right, you'll see kind of an angle, um, you know, more ground level angle. And it's just truly astonishing how much detail there is um, and how these, these must have um, been planted in advance and um, the amount of work and craftsmanship to build this temple carved out of stone. Go over to the left, you can see this extreme detail um, on some of the sides of, of the cave system. And so the most famous is that what you see here on the right is the um, Kailash Temple. Um, and it's supposed to depict the mountain home of Shiva. So that's the most famous and most impressive of uh, the cave uh, temples in Elora. At Mahabalipuram, you have some very interesting examples of art in Southeast India that was made anywhere from the 7th to 8th century. Um, on the top right there, you see the descent of the Ganges. So it's talking about the Ganges River descending from heaven. It's a base relief that's about um, 100 feet by 50 feet. So it's massive, carved from a monolithic rock. And again, you, you can see some of it, but there's amazing detail um, uh, carved from the, the edge of a rock there. And then what you see down here, something important to remember, the Pancharathas, this is the five temples, each dedicated to the five Pandava brothers of the um, Mahabharata fame. And each one of these temples is carved from a single granite stone. So it's kind of interesting. You have these cave um, um, temples that we talked about previously. And you go to a mountainside and carve a temple out of it. Now you have a, a stone, which you carve a temple out of. And it kind of looks like we're moving in the direction of a, a traditional just stone temple created above ground. But this is still a carving. Um, each one of these massive um, temples, with the five brothers carved out of a, a single massive stone. So let's talk a little bit about temples. Temples are a microcosm of society um, in general. So what I mean by that is that in a temple, you can see all the different relationships and different people they would see it in wider um, Indian society. So it's a, it's a it's like almost a little city, if you will. Um, we have craftsmen, you have the priests, you have the traders, people coming in and out. And so temples are, um, you know, massive complex that represents all of all of Indian society on a smaller scale. Um, secondly, it's home of the gods. So the the deities, the idols, there. Um, in the temple. This is where their home is. They're taking care of 
um, by the the care, t care uh, keepers and the, and the priests. And what you see in a temple is all people coming in and out, people going to see astrologers to get their fortune, um, people going to Brahmins, um, the priests, there's visitors, craftsmen, people selling flowers, and other offering to the deity. So it's a very active temples that are um, still in use, are very busy, noisy, people coming in and out. So I'm just going to give you um, two slides here. We talk about temple structures, um, looking at some famous historic sites. In northern India, the most famous place to go is uh, Varanasi, sometimes called Benares. And it's a, a very important holy city along the Ganges River. Um, it's most famous um, because of the um, steps. Um, and this is kind of very important to remember. Um, the steps that descend into the Ganges River. And a lot of people will go to Varanasi to die. And they're hoping that they'll get cremated right there on these steps. On these ghats that are leading into the Ganges River. Um, because of the holiness of the Ganges River. Um, so there's a lot, it's a holy city, the, the temples line the Ganges River. And it goes back to the Gupta Empire, but it was also um, favored during the Mughal Empire, even though the emperors were Muslims. They uh, were patrons of the city, and some of the temples were built by the, uh, during the Mughal Empire. And then a lot within the last couple of centuries, as it was its own independent recognized kingdom, and later, you know, underneath the British, you had a lot of rebuilding of the temple. So um, just a, a lot of holy sites. Um, people come there for bathing rituals, and but more importantly, they come there for the death and cremation rites um, along the Ganges River. And then I would look at two historic temples that are both of massive scale. The first one is the Hampi um, structure, and you can see images of it on the, the top right side. So you can the first thing you're drawn to is this massive gate that's 150 feet tall. Um, and this temple structure is part of a really ancient city. It was one of the actually the biggest um, medieval um, city in India. And during the Middle Ages, it was at times only second to, to Beijing in terms of size. So you have this massive temple dedicated to Shiva that's been um, in place in, since the 7th century, but expanded over time. And so this is a massive complex. And um, one thing that's interesting, both in the Karnak Sun Temple, but also here in Hampi, is the images of um, chariots. So you see below the beautiful picture of the gate in that complex is um, a picture of a chariot. So this is a stone chariot, um, which um, is, is very interesting because the Karnak Sun Temple, which you'll see pictured here on the, the left and on the bottom, is modeled on a chariot. So this is um, a dedicated to an old um, um, deity in a Sun Temple. And it's based on the model of a chariot. So this comes from the 13th century. And you can see um, that structure on the bottom left is a kind of a, a model of a chariot. But if you kind of zoom in, you see one of the chariot wheels, which is depicted on that bottom right. So again, just an amazing detail carved into stone. But again, this is in a monolithic stone. It's not a cave. This is a more traditional, just stone um, temple that is, um, you know, numerous stones put together and carved with just beautiful and intricate um, detail.